Five days after Robert E. Lee surrendered on behalf of the Confederate States of America in Appomattox, Virginia, President Abraham Lincoln was shot to death by Confederate sympathizer John Wilkes Booth at Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C. After the assassination, the murderer hopped on stage from the presidential box shouting, Six Semper Tyrannus, or thus all reads to tyrants. In the leap, he broke his leg, which was set by one of his co-conspirators, Dr. Samuel Mudd. It was determined that there were 10 total conspirators. Booth was killed in the subsequent manhunt, one fled the country, four were hanged, and another four were sent to serve hard labor at Fort Jefferson in the Dry Tortugas. It was a bleak place, still under construction, when the four traders arrived, but it was already the largest brick structure in the Western Hemisphere. Before construction, Commodore David Porter inspected the island in an effort to locate a naval station that would help suppress piracy in the Caribbean. Unimpressed by what he saw, he notified the Secretary of the Navy that the Dry Tortugas were unfit for any kind of naval establishment. He reported that it consisted of small sand islands a little above the surface of the ocean, had no fresh water, scarcely enough land to place a fortification, and in any case were probably not solid enough to bear one. This was where we found ourselves on June 6, 2023 exploring the remnants of a never-finished military outpost prison in the sweltering summer heat and humidity. Fascinated as we were with this old fossil, we couldn't help but to ask ourselves, what brought us here during this most inhospitable time of year? The first recorded Europeans to visit was Ponce de Leon in June of 1513, where his crew caught 160 sea turtles, giving the islands their name. Tortugas is Spanish for turtles. It's the second oldest surviving European place name in the US, behind only Florida itself, which is named after Pasqua, Florida, or the Feast of Flowers, the other name for Easter. The area has a long history of shipwrecks due to the strong tides, rapidly changing weather, and the abundance of shifting sandbars and coral reefs. Roughly 100 ships pass through the Florida Straits each day, with a shipwreck occurring roughly weekly. The Dry Tortugas were seen as the strategic point for the control of the Straits of Florida and the Gulf of Mexico, with work on a lighthouse starting in 1825. Despite Commodore Porter's earlier highly negative assessment in 1825, four years later, Josiah Tattnall III found that he liked the anchorage and declared the Gulf shipping would be in deadly peril if a hostile power occupied the islands. Sixteen years later, in 1845, the area became a military reservation, and year after that, construction began on Fort Jefferson, mostly using slaves hired from owners in Key West, joined by a few Irish immigrants looking for work. What was planned was no ordinary stopover. It would become the largest brick masonry structure in the Americas, about two-thirds the size of the Malbork Castle in Poland, the largest brick masonry structure on the planet. The usage of slave labor stopped in 1863 due to the Emancipation Proclamation, and construction was taken over by military convicts. By November 1864, there were 583 soldiers looking over the 882 convicts on the island. Its construction is baffling to an engineer such as myself. The cannons stationed there had a range of about three miles, meaning it didn't really control the passage of ships, it merely defended itself. In fact, the first thing built there was a lighthouse warning ships to steer clear of the area. Then there's the matter of the moat. Did the designers really believe invaders would cross dozens of miles of treacherous, shipwreck-laden seas to land on the island only to be repelled by a narrow strip of calm water? If they called it a seawall to keep the waves off the walls, to make the, that would make a lot more sense. But they kept referring to it as a moat. Finally. It was built out of bricks, which were rendered obsolete by rifled guns, which were clearly contemporary weapons, since they were stationed in the fort itself. No reliable source of water other than rainfall and distillation, an area of terrible weather and over 60 miles from the nearest place to defend, Key West. The whole place was amazing, but baffling. After the Civil War, the traitor Samuel Mudd and his surviving co-conspirators were imprisoned there. So they kept them here, and these little holes you see on the floor, they carved those in so that there wouldn't be puddles, and so the prisoners made these little troughs just for comfort. So the view from Dr. Mudd's cell. Presumably this is where he had to watch all the tourists come and make fun of him. We were confused to find two cells labeled as his cell, but later learned that Dr. Mudd attempted an escape by stowing away on a supply ship in September after his arrival in July of 1865, and subsequently confined to the lower level dungeon. So cool. 
The fort had a severe yellow fever outbreak in 1868 where Dr. Mudd was instrumental in controlling the disease and is subsequently pardoned from his life sentence by Andrew Johnson, the same man who became president only due to the plot that involved Dr. Mudd's cabal. It just seemed it had too soon. During the Spanish-American War, the U.S. fleet was stationed here, using it as a coaling stop with the remnants of the two coaling piers still visible. One of the ships that passed through to get fueled was the USS Maine on its way to Havana Harbor and its rendezvous with history. The fort was finally abandoned in 1906 after yet another hurricane. Never completed and slowly sinking into the shifting sands, it was designated a national monument in 1935 and achieved national park status in 1992. There are four ways to visit the park. The most common way is to take the two and a half hour each way cruise on the Yankee Freedom Ferry from Key West. This all day adventure gives a four hour stay on the island and runs about $200 per person. We chose the half day seaplane excursion from Key West Airport on one of Key West Seaplane Adventures DHC-3 de Havilland Turbine Otter Amphibians, which ran about $400 per person. We are heading to the Dry Tortugas. We liked it because the travel time was only 40 minutes each direction and still provided us ample time on the island to explore the fort and even take in some snorkeling. It was a real treat being able to sleep in and still get to the island before the crowds arrived on the ferry. Aside from the much shorter bite out of our day in Key West, we were excited to see the area from the sky where we could see turtles, sharks, and a series of shipwrecks starting right after takeoff from the airport. We also flew over the area around the Nuestra Señora de Atocha, where Mel Fisher's team has recovered over $450 million in 40 tons of gold and silver, 114,000 coins, and Colombian emeralds. You get a real appreciation for how treacherous sailing is in this area and why wrecks became so common. Other ways of visiting the park are by personal boat, which requires a permit from the Park Service, or taking a charter for fishing, diving, snorkeling, or wildlife viewing. When visiting, you'll need to bring everything you'll want since there are no services on the island except for restrooms. When the ferry is docked, they ask people to use the restrooms on the ship to reduce traffic on the island's pit toilets. Snorkeling gear is a must for us to beat the heat after wandering around the fort on a hot summer day. It's the second least visited national park in the contiguous United States for a number of valid reasons. First, visiting is very expensive. Second, it's not like most national parks which highlight natural settings unlike any other public alternative. While it is stunning as a bird island sanctuary, it just feels a lot like the other Florida Keys but less crowded. The snorkeling was very comparable to other places in the Keys and conversely diving the wrecks of the Vandenberg off Key West or Spiegel Grove off Key Largo are world-class wreck dive experiences. What we really ended up seeing was an abandoned fort that probably should have never been built in the first place. Attempting such an ambitious structure at a location that's completely unsuitable for it is a valuable lesson we all should learn and serves as a parable for modern military decisions. The rationale behind it was to help fight a war that happened 30 years prior to beginning of the construction and was a source of misery for all who were associated with it. It's a somber monument to failed planning in a setting that really drives the feeling of isolation home to all visitors. Of the 63 national parks, only three are dedicated to structures. Gateway Arch was built in 1963, Mesa Verde built in 1190s, and the Dry Tortugas Fort Jefferson. If you're in Key West, it's definitely worth the visit. We recommend by seaplane, even if you're not limited on time. If you have any other tips on visiting, please leave them in the comments below. If you have other key takeaways from your visit, please share them. Thanks for watching.